This meeting is being recorded. There we go. And I jumped ahead. Uh, then we're going to have an opportunity table for the people here in the room, provided by Ken Jacobson, including some Lelias. Uh, people online and in person have a chance to get a $20 gift certificate to Sunset Valley Orchid. So I'll get your names if you're interested at the end of the session. Um, some quick announcements. There's, of course, AOS judging here in the other room in person. And there'll be some more at uh, <clears throat> Philoli on the 18th, Saturday. Um, you can also go up to past Sacramento to Lincoln, California and get some judging on the 19th or at the next Sacramento Orchid Society meeting on June or July 5th. Um, next Monday, we're also going to have our combined Orchid board meeting and Orchids in the Park show committee, because as you all know, Orchids in the Park is coming up at the end of next month. Is this better? Okay. Sorry. Um, oh, that is better. I'm sorry. Anyway, yes, Orchids in the Park, the end of next month. Uh, if you're like me, you got an email from Dave today reminding you to sign up to volunteer. So we hope you will. Uh, should be a great show. Uh, what was the other announcement? Um, we were informed today the Orchid uh, <clears throat> Conservation Alliance is raising funds to preserve, to help a Dracula reserve that is down in Ecuador. Um, there's some gold mining going on nearby and they're trying to raise funds to get some tracts of land that are nearby in order to preserve the ecosystem there. It became a preserve back in 2015 and they've got a lot of unique Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, there's a lot of rare and unique species of plants and animals there. So they are trying to raise money so it doesn't wind up looking like this. Uh, you can learn more at the Orchid Conservation Alliance.org or by contacting our own Mary Garrison at Mary at Orchid Conservation Alliance.org. Um, so with that, I think I've run through all of my notes. Oh, next week's speaker, or next month's speaker will be Robert Hamilton, and he's going to be talking about the orchid craze, the history of people's obsession with orchids. So that should be a lot of fun. And now we'll get to tonight's main event. Jim Davison is going to talk to us about Lilia Ansep. Uh, so Jim and his wife, Milena Davison, are AOS accredited judges. They have an extensive and diverse orchid collection that seems to be continuously growing, not only involved, involved in caring for their own orchids, they're actively involved in several South Florida orchid societies. Milena is the current president of the Orchid Society of Coral Gables and the past president of the South Dade Amateur Orchid Club. Jim is the past president of the Orchid Society of Coral Gables and the East Ever Everglades Orchid Society. Jim's appreciation for orchids stems from his scientific background. Before his recent retirement, congratulations, he worked as a nuclear chemistry manager at the Turkey Point Nuclear Power Plant. Milena is more interested in the aesthetic qualities of orchids, especially the ones that look strange and otherworldly. She owns her own orchid maintenance business and is known as the Orchid Diva. They are currently preparing a new greenhouse and shade area and have opened their own retail nursery, Jim and I Orchids, which is very clever. Uh, together, Jim and Milena have several grown children and five grandchildren. They live in Homestead, Florida with their two dogs, four of the five grandchildren, and 5,000 or more orchids in their collection, many more in the nursery. Wow. They specialize in Lely Ansep, and I admit that I am weak in my Latin species, so you can read what they are. The Lely Ansett presentation will showcase Jim's favorite species, as well as his first AOS award, and aspects of both the species and hybrids will be discussed. Um, with that, I will stop my sharing.
and I will turn things over to Jim. All right, well, it's great to be with you guys today. Um, I've been doing talks now for, shoot, probably more, well, more than 10 years, uh, but almost always, you know, from South Florida and slowly increasing my reach. And I guess this is now, this is the furthest west I've gone. I think previously was Utah. So thank you very much for getting me back to the, the West Coast. Um, uh, Milana and I were originally from Southern California. And I have to tell you, I miss California a lot. I miss it so much. I, I have a shrine to In-N-Out Burger. So uh, that's the one thing that I really miss, miss a lot. Um, uh, we started uh, our orchid nursery or our uh, judging program in Southern California as part of the Pacific South region. We were uh, clerking in that region uh, for a year. And then that's when the job brought me to Florida and Milan and I, we moved and continued our judging through the uh, Florida Caribbean Judging Center where we've been judges now for, I don't know, long time. I've lost count. Um, I was uh, uh, the Turkey Point Chemistry and Environmental Manager and I was given an early retirement offer and so I decided that I would take that and having a small orchid nursery business was always something that I really wanted to do. I was thought of it as my exit strategy to the day job. And I got a little, uh, little boost, uh, kicked into it a little earlier than I anticipated. And uh, so, uh, you know, we've been doing uh, everything that we need to do to make make a run of it uh, started in 2019 got a good year and then like everybody got our knees cut out from under us with covid really took a, a big shot i see you guys are still doing remote uh, remote meetings and masking is back in california um, but things have been uh, been picking up better uh, here in Florida. So uh, we're real happy to, to get going again. So today, um, today my talk is about Lelia Anseps. And if I can share my screen now, we can get right into that. Woohoo. All right. You got it? Yeah. Everybody's got it. Good. All right. So, um, like I said, Lele Anseps is uh, has been. It, it is my my favorite species, and as most of you, um, most orchid hobbyists, we we all know that orchids is more than just a hobby. It really, it 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 takes so much of our emotional uh, energy into growing the orchids. We get so much reward from them that um, uh, it's very deep within us. And most of us can probably think back and identify that one moment, that moment where you decided, that's it, I'm hooked. I'm gonna be an orchid grower. And for me, it was Lele Anseps. My parents moved to a house when I was 13 years old, a new house. And my next door neighbor, and this is in Southern California, my next door neighbor liked to grow orchids. And he used to show me orchids and stuff. And I was always kind of a horticultural nerd. Um, and I had a little tomato patch next to the, to the garage. And one day I'm out there tending the tomatoes and out of the corner of my eye, I see this lavender purple color 
in in the corner and it's, I never had seen that before what's you know what's that doing there and I turn and look and there is a Lely Anceps on his Mexican fan palm blooming right there in in Southern California and I just I just freaked out it's like oh my god this is right out of my biology book this is the most incredible thing that thing has that plant has been there for so long and i had never ever noticed it it was maybe 10 feet up a palm tree and there it was in its glorious bloom and i was just amazed by that and that was it that was it 13 years old i i knew orchids were something special and uh, i got my first orchid when i was 17 which i promptly killed like i'm sure a lot of us do and uh from there it just it just grew and grew and grew and now i've devoted so many brain cells to to orchids it's uh it's hard to fit anything else in there let's get through to ancepts see if i can here we go. So I call the presentation La Princesa because Lele Anceps is a Mexican species. So uh, we should have a Mexican uh, Spanish title to that. And uh, we like to consider the Cattleyas as the queen of orchids. And if the Cattleya are the queen of orchids, then Lele Anceps must be the princess. So this is La Princesa. Now the species, um, everybody falls in love with Anceps. Uh, uh, it was introduced to Europe in 1880. And from the get-go, it has been a favorite of many, many, many orchid growers. And today there are uh, well, what I have here is the slide 138 quality and culture awards from the American Orchid Society. Well, I just checked earlier and there's 30 more. So it's 168. And the most recent awards are uh, uh, 2022. So people have been enamored with the species Lele Anceps from its first introduction all the way to the present and they continue to get a lot of uh, a lot of awards so the species um, first described in 1835 and uh, it has uh, two subspecies there's the anceps subspecies which um, is in mexico and guatemala it has a diploid chromosome count of 40 and then there's the subspecies Dasonii, uh, which is more the Guerrero state and Oaxaca uh, state of Mexico also has a diploid chromosome count of 40. This is the Lelia Anceps that you would find in the forest of Mexico. Somewhere around a thousand meters, uh, the plant grows on uh, oak trees, does uh, makes very, very large specimens. And uh, this is a very typical example of the, the, what you would find naturally. It has a starry shape. I'll use my mouse pointer here. Um, all, uh, almost always a darker, a darker lip with a yellow raised keel in the center of the lip, down into the throat, and then dark burgundy lines in the throat. These are characteristics of the species that um, are in all ancepts. And many of these traits are passed on to progeny as well. This is the subspecies, oh. This one is the subspecies Anceps, sorry. And this one here, this is the subspecies Dawsonii. You see, this is more, is white. And the subspecies Dawsonii 
really, really made a huge uh, sensation in Europe because of its white flower. So it typically has is white. There may be color in the lip, and the uh, same yellow keel and the uh, burgundy striping in the throat. Uh, remember the Dasonii is native to the Guerrero region and the Oaxaca region of Mexico. This is the flower that the Mexicans treasure uh, and use in their uh, Dia de los Muertes or the Halloween uh, celebrations that they have in Mexico because of the white, the white flower. This is another example. This one has no coloring in the lip. This is a good example of the Dasonia. And here's the regions, and uh, I apologize. I don't know how my little markers got pushed out into the water, but here in this uh, uh, geographic uh, map of Mexico, we have the uh, Dasonii, which are closer to the coastline, right down in here. And just imagine all this getting pushed southwest a little bit. And the subspecies Anceps is on the east side. So Mexico has a high mountain range uh, that, well, it's the same mountain range that we have in California, Sierra Nevada and it continues down through Mexico and splits Mexico. So you've got the subspecies Anceps on the east side and the subspecies Dasonii on the west side. And you can see the Anceps has some uh, reach down into uh, Guatemala as well. So yeah, we said that. And there we go. So here's a couple of pictures of in situ anceps, the uh, uh, growing in the oak trees. And you can see they can make some, they make some very large specimens. Um, and uh, as harsh as the climate is and, and growing in nature, still these plants can produce very, very large specimens. And this is really uh, an attribute of how uh, characteristic of how hardy these plants can be. So in their native habitat, temperatures can range from freezing all the way up to 105 degrees. And so the Lele Anceps has really developed a, a, a good reputation of being a very, very hardy grower. And uh, a lot of the, a lot of uh, hybrids made with Lele Anceps um, sometimes they are referred to as cool cats because they are more tolerant of cooler temperatures. The, the cool uh, ans anceps cold tolerance passes down to its progeny. So um, here you can see how even in nature they produce very large specimens. Now I want to introduce a concept of polyploidy. Uh, I, I, I can't see everybody's hands up here, but um, there, I know there are probably some of you that uh, talk about or understand the concept of polyploidy. But for those of you who are not familiar with the term, polyploidy refers to the chromosome count um, in the plant. And so humans, for example, have 26 chromosomes and half are the chromosomes we get from our mother and half of the chromosomes we get from our father. And uh, this is true in plants as well, that there's female um, egg and then there is pollen from the male and that you get half of the chromosomes from each parent. Well, there is a mutation and this is, this is the, the mutations in orchids is is um, really profound. And that's how they speciate around the world is their ability to, uh, to mutate readily. And one of the mutations that they do naturally is a doubling of the chromosome count. 
So instead of having a 2N or double chromosome, they get a 4N or quadruple the chromosome count. And here's an example of the effect of the chromosome count. These are two of the Bichiana color form ANCEPs. The one on the, the bottom left here, this is a typical 2N uh, flower that you would find uh, in its natural habitat. This plant was collected in Mexico way back in the day when it you were allowed to do that. And the one on the right, this is a line bred um, anceps that uh, came out of Carter and Holmes nursery uh, right around 2002. And uh, you can see there is a tremendous difference in size of the flower. Uh, color is pretty much the same, but tetraploid plants tend to have, because of that, that all of that chromosome material in the cells, they tend to be larger flowers, flowers with more substance, la longer lasting flowers. And uh, these traits are um, for, for humans uh, are more aesthetically pleasing. They're a, a bigger and rounder flower. And we all get excited when we see big round flowers. And so this is an example. Here's another one. This plant on the left, this was uh, the type color lavender with a darker lip. This is Irwin's. Uh, this was a very, very well-known uh, cultivar uh, way back in the day. It was so popular that it had been cloned many, many times. And out of that cloning process came the natural mutation of the tetraploid version. And here next to it is the tetraploid Irwins. And you can see the flower segments are much wider. Uh, they have more substance and uh, much prettier uh, aesthetically. So this is why a, a lot of the a lot of the line breeding that is occurring right now with Lelia anceps is to use the tetraploid versions because they are um, they're just a, a nice looking flowers, and we can we'll see a lot of those um, through the throughout the presentation. So let's look at the natural color forms. These color forms these are the colors that are described by the taxonomists. This is the type color. We often, we say TIPO. Uh, this is uh, uh, what we would consider the Mendenhall type. Um, so way back in the day, I think, uh, shoot, in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, the Carter and Holmes organization or nursery produced a natural tetraploid um, and uh, that was a very large flower, had very wide segments. And uh, instead of a pointed uh, petal, they're more rounded, okay? And this became known as the Mendenhall type. And I was doing some research and I found that the um, the American Orchid Society Award for the Mendenhall uh, cultivar was actually uh, given to a grower at in the San Francisco Orchid Society. How about that? So I'm sure it was a, it was probably a clone, but still it was a 1991. Um, the Mendenhall variety received its uh, first award. And since then, there have been many. But this is type uh, lavender with a darker lavender lip. It has the yellow keel and uh, burgundy striping, uh, classic ancepts. Here's another one. This is called Blushing Bride. And just is to show you, it's still the type color. 
um, because it's lavender with a darker lip. But uh, this is 2022, uh, clearly a tetraploid as well. But um, this is this is just to show you that uh, they're still very very popular, and they can be very very floriferous. And so here, this is a an example, 184 flowers and 40 buds on uh, how many, 84 inflorescences. That's pretty incredible that uh, there are so many flowers. And this is a hobby grown plant. Very, very cool. I'm sure some of you must have ancepts in your collection and you guys are probably growing in this big as well. There is a semi-alba color form. It's white with a colored lip. Um, uh, it still has the lines in the throat and the yellow keel. And this is, you know, we're going through these color forms and it, it was really identified very early by the Europeans that what makes ANSEP so attractive is there are so many different color forms. And we are all familiar with the Cattleyas and the, their typical color forms of, uh, you know, lavender, alba, semi-alba, and cerulea. But we'll see, uh, Anseps takes it another step further. So here's another semi-alba. This is a, a more recent, recent one. There is a true alba. Um, it differs from uh, you because in the throat, there are no um, anthocyanin pigments and the lines, they're still there, but instead of being burgundy in color, they're yellow. So the yellow keel, the stripes are yellow, and all white flower. That's a, the true alba. So they would uh, they would um, breed true. And here's another another one. Uh, that first one was mine, and this is an awarded one. And you can see a good nice shot right down the throat. You can see how the lines. Uh, there's no burgundy in the in the lip at all. So that's the alba color form. Then there is the cerulea color form. Now, uh, this is Milana, and this is my wife's name, Milana, and this is the plant that uh, is my very, very first um, AOS award, and I named it after Milana. And as you can imagine, I got a lot of mileage from that. So very, I've uh, been very, very uh, pleased at how this turned out. Uh, we got this plant from Carter and Holmes, um, one of their um, uh, offerings of an Anseps, the Vichiana type. And um, when I, I knew it was good, but this is way before I was in the judging program. And I didn't really know how good it was, but I decided that I would take it to the judging center and have the judges look at it. And when I took it into the room, you could, you could just hear everybody gasp, like, oh my gosh, look what just walked in the room. And they were, they were not looking at me. And... Um, I was very, very unsure of what was going on, but they invited me to sit with them uh, while they're judging. I'm just off to the side and I could hear them discussing the merits of the flower saying, oh no, this can't be Anseps. This has to be a hybrid. It's just too good. It's too good to be Anseps. But luckily for me, uh, Fred Clark of Sunset Valley Orchids, he was the captain of that team, and he's, uh, he's an expert in, in the Anseps himself, and he said, nope, 
this is Anceps and these are the reasons why. And he laid it all out for the judges. They decided to score it and it got an 82 AM. And I was so excited about that. My first American Orchid Society award. And Fred told me uh, when we were done, he said, if this, uh, since this was its very, very first bloom on a seedling plant, and it only had two flowers. If it had five flowers, it would have gotten an FCC. But what is, what is uh, more remarkable than just getting the award for myself? I mean, I was excited about that, but this is the very, very first Lely Anceps in the history of the American Orchid Society to be described as color cerulea. All the other ones have been described as variety Beachiana, which is a white flower with a cerulea colored lip. And it's a little hard to tell from this photo. This is the award photo. But at the ends of the petals here, you can see there is some cerulea venation and a slight, there is a slight cerulea tint to the petals. And this is why they described it as cerulea. So uh, there we go. It was like the first in the world. That's very exciting. Very, very exciting. This is, uh, this is the second flowering of the Milana orchid. And here you can see there's a little bit more of the cerulea tint there in the petals. Mm -hmm. As a second flowering, the um, the the lip was also more saturated, so it's pretty good. This is Forma lineata. Now, uh, a lot of folks might look at this and say, "Oh, look, this is color break in the petals. This has virus," but this is not virus. This is a color form. It is found in nature, and it has these crazy um, stripes. And it is a form of Peloria. But uh, this is a very, very interesting uh, color form. You don't see it very often in, in the orchid world at all. Uh, but this is very cool. It's also called Disciplinata, the variety Disciplinata. But it is described as Lineata. We've got some other ones. This is another one. And here you can see. On this example, you can see some of the striping that's the peloria coming through from the lip, the burgundy stripe from the lip as the petals are, are mimicking uh, the lip in its nature. And there's uh, another more uh, contemporary version, the feathered lady, uh, an FCC in the last couple of years. Very, very nice. And Sandbar striata, another one. And this is a uh, uh, this is a culture awarded uh, example of the lineata. A lot of flowers. It's amazing. So those are the those are the those are the color forms described by the taxonomists. And now we'll go into the varieties. And so. Way back in the day, when uh, Europeans were sending orchid collectors all over the New World to try and find new species and new varieties of orchids, every time they would find a color form that would be slightly different, they wanted to name it after themselves. And so uh, this is Barker's uh, Anceps or Barkeriana. And it's characterized by having the, the color from the lip comes around and is on the, uh, the midlobes that circle the column. This is a more contemporary version, but it has that same coloring going around. Then there's variety Sanderiana. Uh, this is actually just a synonym 
of the Dasonii subspecies. And so when you are shopping and you're looking for ANCEPs, and it's entirely possible that you will find something labeled variety Sanderiana. But understand that when you see Sanderiana, it is the Dasonii subspecies and you'll be looking at white flowers, maybe color in the lip and the red um, markings in the throat. Then the variety of Oaxacana, uh, this mm -hmm. is another uh, example of the Dasonii, uh, no color in the lip per se, um, very, very nice uh, pure white flowers are uh, very attractive. And uh, they were collected extensively by um, a lot of the um, early California nurseries that were growing ANCEPs. This is the, uh, the flower that we were just looking at, the Oaxacana variety. The Santa Barbara Orchid Estate made a selfing of a select clone that they had collected from Mexico. And from that, uh, from that selfing came this natural tetraploid that they named Sandbar Marble King. And uh, it was an absolutely uh, amazing flower, very big, very wide segments, uh, very, very robust grower. And for the longest years, it must be 30, 40 years, they kept that plant tight under their control. They never released a piece of it. And then back in around 2000, 15, 2017, somewhere in that range. Um, I guess they decided that it's been long enough and they, they were going to release a piece of it. And they uh, put a piece on the auction block for the American Orchid Society. And uh, you all don't know Milana very well, but I can assure you when she gets her mindset on something, she is not going to put that paddle down. And uh, she, she bid and she won this plant. So I get to say that I'm a lucky owner of a piece of this uh, Marble King. We'll be using that in, in our breeding program. This is the variety Beachiana. Um, this is Fort Caroline, which is one of the parents to the Milana orchid. It's white with the cerulea lip, uh, first awarded in 85 here, the Fort Caroline. And uh, it is a very elegant looking flower. You know, it has a nice horizontal presentation uh, of the petals. And uh, even though the, the, the lateral sepals are kind of swept downward and not a true equilateral triangle, uh, it's very elegant, and because of that, uh, it was very, very popular and cloned many, many times. And this, uh, this came from the Fort Caroline orchids uh, in uh, South Carolina. And from that, uh, from the cloning process, there was a chance tetraploid, and this is now the Fort Caroline 4N variety. So now there's a um, much larger flower, very nice saturation and uh, color saturation in the lip. Uh, it's very, very attractive uh, cerulea coloring. This is the variety Guerrero. Um, it, it differs from the others. It has flares on the, on the petals. This is um, the subspecies Dawsonii forma chilipinensis, uh, named for the town um, that, uh, around which this variety is known. So here's the Guerrero State here in Mexico and, the, and that city right here. This is where um, the region where that orchid is, was found. And so the chilipinensis. Uh, 
this is uh, also, this is Guerrero and this is the um, sandbar, uh, sandbar, um, shoot, I forget the name, I didn't write it here. It's sandbar Guerrero. Uh, I almost had one of these. I had it in my hand. Uh, I was in the uh, Santa Barbara Orchid Estate Nursery and I found this plant hanging, hanging from a rafter uh, in the nursery and I picked it up and I'm walking around with it. Uh, I saw the tag and I'm an ANSEPS fan. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get this one. And I'm walking around the nursery and the proprietor, he sees me with this plant and he's like, hey, where did you get that? I said, oh, I just like right over there. And he grabs it out of my hand and he says, this is not for you. This is for my special customers. And off he went. <laughs> I was uh, quite surprised, but I had, I had one of these, but I, I didn't get too offended. Uh, this is uh, way back in 2000, around that time frame, And at that time it was $50 a bulb. And I had $350 in my hand. So that was out of my budget. So I wouldn't have gotten it anyway. But um, there we go. This is the mm -hmm. variety disciplinata. Um, candy stripes, again, this is the lineata color form. Uh, just the uh, same thing, another name, variety disciplinata. Variety Chamberlainiana uh, is another uh, variety uh, and varieties uh, in nature are characterized by uh, a natural population. It's not just a single plant uh, discovered in the forest, but there's actually a population and, and of the same coloring. And this is, and that's how they get the term variety. And this is Gigas. And uh, Chamberlainiana is known by having more saturated color. Uh, variety Delicata is a um, almost albescence in a way. This is the Dasonii variety, but it's a very, very delicate. Uh, this photo doesn't give it justice, but it's a very soft pink, very soft pink. And, um, but it is the Dasonii variety, as you can see with the stripes in the throat and it's mostly, mostly white in appearance. Here's another more modern Delicata variety. This is Laska, which is available at the Santa Barbara Orchid Estate. Very soft pink, uh, almost, and, and basically con color where you know, then the type color of Anseps is lavender with a darker lip. Here you can see that the lip is basically the same color. So that's the Delicata. Ashworthiana, this is another plant that you can find sometimes from the Santa Barbara Orchid Estate. It's a very small flower, um, albescence, uh, that's all I know about it. It's just it's just a, a particularly small flower. You could tell by the shape of the flower that this is a, a two n variety, a two n plant, a diploid, and uh, a lot of these uh, novelty varieties will be diploid because uh, hybridizers have mostly only been working with uh, the major color forms. This is variety Reblingiana and Sandbar Super Splash Cultivar. And you can see this is a true Poloric uh, where the, the lip is mimicking, I mean, the petals are mimicking the lip in, in form and the, the color of the lip, the very, broad uh, size of the lip of the petals and the striping down into the throat. 
uh, and even some remnants of the yellow keel uh, are, are seen here in the flower. Uh, this is a, a true pyloric. This is the Rebeling Guiana. Uh, as a, uh, another note, because it's pyloric and the petals are acting like the lip, the petals tend to jet forward the same way that the lip does. And so flowers tend to be a little bit cuppy in form. This is variety Vestalis. Uh, this is where the lip is a, is a different kind of mutation where the lip takes on the form of the petal. This is Vestalis different kind of uh, Peloria, like a reverse Peloria. And this is variety Guatemala. This is a, a variety, a population found in Guatemala. And you can see by looking at this that it differs quite a bit from the ANSEPs that we've been looking at previously. So here, uh, the, the relative size of the flower the petal width is very broad and very large petals in relation to the size of the flower. And conversely, the lip is proportionally smaller uh, than the other ancepts that we've seen. They still have the yellow keel and it still has the lines in the throat. So uh, it, is, uh, it is classified as Lely ancepts. Um, but it is, it's very different. And uh, this particular variety is found only in Guatemala, hence the name. So uh, what modern hybridizers have been trying to do is combine the different color forms and take some of those uh, really interesting varieties and combine them with the known tetraploids and try and make improved form of these novelty varieties. And so let's take a look and see what's been done so far. So this is a Mendenhall type. And uh, this is a, uh, a hybrid, uh, Mucho Gusto by Deja Vu. Both are Mendenhall types and it produced a classic Mendenhall variety. So it's not uh, necessarily different, um, and uh, but very, very consistent, very, very nice uh, appearing flowers. Nice lip, very broad lip. So that's the type. So here's another one, Ultimo by Las Brisas. These are two Mendenhall type, produced Mirta Isabel. This is a, uh, a plant that was recently awarded um, out of Hawaii. Uh, is very, very large in form and received an FCC. This is from Orchid Eros. Uh, ben Oliveros um, grew this plant. And it has these little flares, which is uh, reminiscent of the original Mendenhall. This is another one, the Blushing Bride. Very nice, very wide petals. Again, very recent also. This is Sandbar Marble King. Uh, we saw that a little bit earlier. And this was derived from the chance tetraploid of the Oaxacana selfie. But uh, it's such a nice plant uh, you can understand that the Santa Barbara Orchid Estate would want to use this in their own line breeding program. Even if they weren't willing to share pieces of this plant, they would use it, and they did. And um, it took quite a few years, but um, in 2020, uh, it was uh, finally elevated to an FCC. So this is Sandbar Marble Hall. This is using a type colored Mendenhall with uh, the Marble King. And this produced a very nice 
large type colored flower. This is uh, using Delicata with a Dasonii variety. Um, and we get another Dasonii. So sometimes they don't necessarily turn out the way we expect them to. This is another improved Guerrero where you get uh, flares at the ends of the petals. This is Mono Lake. Here's uh, Las Brisas by Disciplinata. Here, the hybridizer is trying to create a large flower with the Disciplinata candy stripes. And once again, they don't always turn out the way you want them. Hmm. This is Rebeling Guiana by uh, another uh, Mendenhall type, I guess. And uh, in this particular case, the Peloria of the Riblingiana uh, carried forward, carried through, and we get a really nice improved Riblingiana. It's a much flatter flower. Uh, the petals do not jut forward even near as much as the original Riblingiana. But you can see candy, uh, the same kind of striping from the Riblingiana some of the yellow keel and striping coming through as well. So uh, that's a very, very nice example of the modern Anseps breeding right there. Very, very showy, very, very showy. And you can imagine uh, when this plant gets really big, it's going to put on a really nice show. This is another um, Guerrero type, Rosmina. This came out of Mexico a few years back and it has a very nice wide uh, petals and the flares at the tips, but it's uh, noted for having this very, very deep um, red colored lip. Very, very nice. And so using Rosmina uh, is an attempt to try and carry that, uh, that color forward and get, instead of a lavender lip, get a uh, darker, richer red on the lip. This is a good example of that. So very, very rich color here in the lip. Very wide petals too. Very, very nice. Now this is uh, Lele Anseps Walbrun. You can see that this is a Guatemala type. Um, has a, it's a diploid flower. It's relatively small, uh, but it had very, very wide segments. And so uh, this particular clone won an award many years ago, but it would be used in breeding programs because of those wide segments. And the Santa Barbara Orchid Estate took their Marble King and combined it with Walbrun to produce the Pink Perfection strain of Ansets. And here uh, it was presented at the 2008 World Orchid Conference and it received the um, award of quality, which is an award given to the hybridizer for producing this new strain of Ansets. Uh, uh, they took, even though it used the, uh, the Dotsonii version, the Marble King, which is mostly white, the Walbrun pink color carried forward and all of the offspring are various shades of pink. And some have uh, nice large lips and some have relatively small lips, but uh, that just shows the, the diversity of the, of the breeding in the color or in, in the forms. And here, the pink perfection strain, to, to receive the AQ, it needed to have at least one award. And I believe out of the uh, 12 plants that were exhibited, it got four awards. Um, 
I was fortunate. I was in um, Miami at the time. So I was able to, I, I saw this um, exhibited. It was uh, for, for me, since it's my favorite orchid, I was uh, very, very impressed. And let's look at some of the hybrids. Remember I said some of the characteristics that carry forward are the raised keel and the striping in the lip. This is uh, LC Puppy Love, Catlea Dubiosa by Anceps. And Dubiosa has a, a very flat Lotogesii in the background. And here the throat has these uh, uh, vestiges of the uh, striping in the throat. But uh, Puppy Love is the highest awarded of all of the Anceps hybrids uh, produced by Stewart Orchids in California uh, many, many years ago. So 16 awards and uh, it's been used quite extensively itself in hybrid programs. And uh, just recently, Sunset Valley Orchids remade the Puppy Love. This is Elsie Miss Wonderful, uh, uses Mary's Song by Anceps. Mary's Song is, um, has a flare, a natural uh, flared flower, and this carries forward into the Miss Wonderful. You get a, a really beautiful flared Anceps type flower. There's several different varieties, uh, different color forms. You can see the range here. Uh, you can see the characteristic keel and lines in the throat. This one was one that I flowered. Uh, then there's Lay, uh, Lelianthi, which is uh, used to be LC Wrigleyi, but now uh, Borangiana is in Guarianthi, so it's uh, Lelianthi. Uh, Borangiana is, gives you uh, Lelianthi Wrigleyi. Uh, this is the type color form of Wrigleyi, but we know that Borangiana has a cerulea color form and Lele Anceps has the Vichiana color form and somebody's got to do that cross, right? And yeah, they didn't, they didn't waste any time. And this is the Wrigley uh, cerulea color form. Absolutely gorgeous plant. Gorgeous, mm -hmm. gorgeous plant. You can still find pieces of this I don't think this has ever been cloned, but every once in a while, if you're shopping on eBay or Etsy or some of these uh, online stores, you may find a piece of the original Blue Lagoon. Absolutely amazing, beautiful, beautiful flowers. And of course, uh, uh, LC, Santa Barbara Sunset. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, one of the most popular uh, Lele Anceps hybrids because of its floriferousness produces these uh, peachy colored uh, sunset tone uh, flowers, very, very long stems uh, from Anceps and the, uh, the Rupiculus Lelia in the background. Um, very, very floriferous as well. This plant won the reserve grand champion at the uh, Tamiami Orchid Festival a few years back. So I use this to demonstrate to Florida orchid growers that yeah, you can grow Anceps and Anceps hybrids in Florida as well. This is, a, uh, this is what um, Californians uh, can do a little bit better. This is uh, Showtime, um, that same, same plant, but much, much more, many more flowers. This is Coastal Splendor, uh, taking the, um, a, uh, either a semi-alba anceps or a Dasonii variety anceps, combining it with Persepolis Splendor. This is Persepolis Splendor a standard uh, semi-alba, and it produces a more Anceps-like semi-alba. Very, very attractive 
uh, four inch flowers, white with a colored lip, beautiful, beautiful throat with those lines in the throat. Several different uh, awarded cultivars on uh, the coastal splendor. Here's another one. Very, very nice. Now, uh, we've seen a lot of the Cattleya colors, uh, the lavenders and blues and semi-albas, but we haven't seen uh, Lele Anceps combined with anything in the red to orange color. And so this is Harpophila. This is a rupiculus Cattleya, Brazilian Cattleya, used to be Lelia, and uh, combined with Anceps. And what color do you think you would get combining this with a Dasonii variety? We would get yellow. And so this is Canariensis using the Harpophila. Very, very nice. Uh, this was uh, introduced uh, many years ago and it uh, hasn't been remade in a long, long time, but you might be able to find uh, pieces of uh, Canariensis. And if you take a red uh, Sophronitis, Coccinia hybrid, Wendy's Valentine, uh, which is a, a very a, a small red Cattleya combined with Anceps, you get Sinbu Lady, which was, uh, this is a clone um, released from Taiwan uh, many years ago and has uh, been awarded since its initial release. And it's uh, more red in color, taking that red coloring from that uh, Sophronitis, but still retaining that those beautiful markings in the throat. Now here's uh, just to show you how the Anceps will carry forward multiple generations. Melody Fair is a standard semi-alba, and this is Liptonii, which is a an Anceps hybrid. And so you can see the lines in the throat here. So this is an Anceps hybrid and you combine the two and you get Carol. Uh, or shoot, this has a new name, but I, I didn't get it in here. Uh, it, it has been registered, but you get a very, very flat flower, nice wide segments, uh, very, very attractive. And 25% is Lele Anceps. Oops. So um, now if we take, uh, this is a, a more recent cross, taking a Mendenhall type, combining with um, Pink Empress. And this is supposed to go away, sorry folks. And you get a very, very nice um, round flower. There's the lines in the throat. Sorry, I have to fix that slide. But let's talk about the culture now. That's kind of a, a description of the of how the hybrids have been working out. Uh, even today, uh, there are hybrids being made and, and awarded. Um, so Anceps, because of their elevation, uh, where they grow, they can tolerate extremes of temperature. So they can actually tolerate below freezing down to 26 that's when they're attached to a tree. And a large oak tree is a, is a very good heat mass. And so that heat can uh, help protect the roots and, and rhizome. And so even if the leaves freeze, uh, the rhizome can survive and the plant can survive. But easily to 100 degrees, 105 degrees is not out of the, the ballpark. Uh, they're very, very bright uh, growers, 2,500 to 3,500 foot candles. So if you're going to grow them, grow them high in your growing space. Um, 3,500 foot candles or 3,000 foot candles would be about 70% shade. Uh, water, when the plants are mounted, they can be watered 
pretty much every day during the spring and summer, which is their uh, main growing season. But they like to have a little bit of a drier winter rest. So now here in Florida, um, the cold fronts that come through Florida uh, are always preceded by rain. And the ANSEPs have absolutely no trouble tolerating the, the drop in the temperature, but they don't like the drop when wet. And so I have to caution you guys in the Bay Area as well. And I'm sure, you know, I, I'd like to get some feedback from you guys, but in the winter time, I know the storms, the January is probably your wettest month of the year. It's also cold in January. And so uh, plants would do better if they're allowed to stay dry during those uh, winter rainstorms. Humidity uh, is 45 to 55% and always uh, with like other epiphytic cattleyas, air movement is very, very important. For media, we like to grow plants mounted here in Florida, and I'm sure they would do very, very well mounted in California as well. Uh, Coke, orc, or basket, growing them in a basket. <clears throat> in California, typically, uh, anseps are grown in bark mixes with a very large chunk. We want the large pieces of bark so that the plants, um, the roots can dry out in between waterings. Uh, and uh, in, in California, we used to, we would uh, water a couple of times a week in a bark, uh, in a pot with bark, uh, but we would water, I would still water my my Milana ANSEPs every single day when uh, during the growing season uh, when I was growing it in a small greenhouse. Uh, whatever you choose to grow it in, uh, always uh, uh, really stress excellent drainage. Uh, you could use net pots and uh, you want to keep uh, large chunks so the roots can dry in between the waterings. There's another way in California, like my neighbor, when I was 13, you can naturalize ANSEPs. Maybe not in the Bay Area. Uh, certainly Southern California is much closer climate to their natural habitat. Uh, but this is uh, another way that they can be grown. And as this is a question, I always present to all of my talks is when do we repot and when do we divide our plants? And I can't really pose that question to this group. So I'll just throw it out here. This is the answer, new roots. So we always do our repotting when our plants are producing new roots. I'm not a real big fan uh, about growing, uh, rule-based growing. Wow. Um, when I moved to Florida, I discovered everything I knew about orchids was wrong. So I needed to relearn how to grow plants. And what I have discovered in that time is we do everything we possibly can to replicate the conditions of nature. And the better we are at replicating nature, the more vigorous our plants will grow. And we want to, we always want to repot or divide our plants when they're just producing new roots or just about to produce new roots. Because uh, as the plants go through different phases of growth cycles and flowering cycles, if you do your division when the new roots are emerging, then that plant will be able to reestablish itself very, very quickly. No matter how careful you are, when you're repotting, you are going to damage roots. And so by using it, uh, doing that repotting with new roots, the plant uh, oftentimes will not even skip a beat. 
the divided, your division will still flower at its next growth cycle. And, and, and that's really what we want. Uh, if you do your repotting at the right, wrong time, it's possible that you're, after damaging the roots, your plant can, can languish with uh, insufficient root system for the size of the plant and you can lose leaves and it can actually decline. And in the worst, worst case um, situation, you may even lose the plant altogether. But this is why I emphasize the new roots. There's only one rule. That's, that's the only rule. So there are nuisance species here. This is a Oaxacana. Uh, this is a natural hybrid with Anceps and Halbingeriana. Halbingeriana was, is one of those um, a former Schomburgias that was reclassified into Lelia. And this is a natural hybrid. So something new. And this is the big one. This is the big surprise. So remember the Guatemala variety down here on the right side? Well, uh, there's a gentleman that Milana and I know, Freddy Archila from Guatemala. He's a taxonomist. And he and some of his colleagues have published a paper reclassifying uh, the variety Guatemala into a separate species called Matai. Now, this was published in 2013. The Royal Horticultural Society has not recognized Matai, even though it has, uh, it's been published. But let's just look at some of these uh, characteristics quickly and see. Anceps is from Mexico, Matai, Guatemala, and Honduras. Anceps is a medium-sized plant, pseudobulb 6 to 10 centimeters with a long 70 centimeter inflorescence. But Matai is smaller. It's a dwarf plant. Pseudobulbs are smaller than six centimeters and the inflorescence is 40, just so over, just a little bit over half is length. Anceps flower size is eight to 12 centimeters and Matai again, half the size, five to six centimeters. And this is one of the big things that taxonomists should look at uh, blooms, Anceps blooms December to January and Matai blooms in September. This is suggesting that they may even have uh, different pollinators. And Anceps blooms or grows from 800 to 1500 meters, whereas Matai is much more tropical, much warmer uh, with a 400 meter elevation. So Anceps, uh, it's a, uh, you know, Mexico is very, very tropical, has a very narrow diurnal range, but because of that high elevation, it's high and low are um, considerably cooler than what the Guatemala variety would experience at 400 meters. And so um, here in Florida, those pink perfection ones that have the Guatemala variety, in it, uh, they do fairly well here in South Florida. We're very, very tropical. And so that is my presentation. I've got a lot of thanks to go around to some of the uh, orchid growers. As you'll recognize, most of these guys are in Southern California. Uh, they've uh, helped me very much in putting together the presentation. And I hope that I've been able to uh, share some of this with you and that it, it's meaningful and relevant to you in the Bay Area because I've never tried to grow orchids in San Francisco, but I know you guys are good at it. So that's, uh, that's what we got. So um, uh, I, I neglected, it's been quite a while. We went back to live talks here um, probably six months ago. So I got a little bit out of the uh, 
uh, Zoom uh, mode and uh, the Zoom groove, so to speak, uh, I used to like. I would like like to have um, people just chime in when they have a question because oftentimes uh, what I learned is you you ask for questions at the end of a talk and all you get is crickets because uh, either the question was answered or uh, somebody's forgot about the question and they're no longer, oh, I'll just let that go. So uh, I'd like to encourage anybody, you know, if, if you had any questions, please, please, let's, let's hear it. So we're gonna get crickets. I have a question and a statement. Oh, um, thanks, Tom. My name's Tom. First of all, ANCEPs grow crazy out here. No problem whatsoever. Excellent. Um, and Robel, Indiana, <clears throat> it's listed under Dawsonia, Dawsonii type. Um, no, that's a, it's actually a variety. Um, I wouldn't necessarily characterize it as the Dawsonii subspecies. Um, well, I was just looking it up on Q because I was curious because most of your Dawsonii's are white. Yes. And of course, Robel, Indiana is not. I have several of the feathered flame that Fordyce used to use a lot of. So, uh, so Q characterized it as the subspecies Dawsonii. Yeah. Okay. All I just right. was curious as to why. That's all. Uh, probably because of the the base color. So even though there's color, um, it it, it may, the variety may have been found on the west coast. Okay. Thanks. Good talk. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ju jump in as a Southern Californian. Zoom has its advantages uh, because I am no, no, I'm an eight hour commute from San Francisco, but uh, I love coming to the meetings. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, ANCEPs on my patio, I found that they basically hate pots, and I've gone more and more to the wooden baskets and yes. which is like a three dimensional mount. As yes. far as rain is concerned, what's that? Yeah, right. yeah. So uh, a, a basket is a mount. Yeah. Absolutely, it's a mount. And, um, you know, whenever we put the ANCEPs in a basket, if you're going to include media in the basket, just make sure that it's very large chunks, very well drained. Um, as, little, as little as possible, but I've, I've never noticed right. any particular problem with them getting, getting rained on, but then typically when it rains, at least here, uh, there's cloud cover. And so those nights are not that cold. You very rarely have, have rain and real cold because it gets cold when it clears up. Well, it, uh, you guys can um, educate me. Uh, my experience is that the ANCEPs, they, they don't like going to bed with wet feet, cold, wet feet. And so... Uh, having a cold rainstorm and then, um, you know, having the temperatures fall into the 30s uh, and wet um, in Florida, they don't like that at all. Yes, yeah, see, you know, see I, our are a little, little different. It's actually very rare that it gets in the 30s when, when it rains, you know, it'll be 45 to 50 because the cloud okay. cover keeps, it keeps the temperature up. Okay, so uh, when you get the cold weather, it's always clear skies, right? And it's not, and and that's what they like. So it's it's cold, but it's dry, and that's right. that, and that's more like their natural habitat. So okay, good to know. Um, that's very much the way it was in Southern California. You know, it's just uh, you know only only cold when it's clear sky, right? They, 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 that's that's how how I get away with uh, with growing all kinds of things outside. Okay, okay. Uh, have have any of you had uh, success naturalizing ANCEPs in the in the yard, like my neighbor did in Southern California? I don't have a tree to do it on. It would, it would be easy <laughs> if if I did. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, the other problem when you put it on a tree is then you have to worry about watering it and setting up a sprinkler system because, of course, rain rain comes out of the end of a hose. 
Oh, that's right. That's right. See, I've been away from California for so long. You know, we, See, we, we don't have, have that. You know, but you know, at least in Southern California, we had you know maybe maybe three three good storms in the entire winter, and that that's it. You know, right. so you right. don't depend on rain to water your plants. Yeah, and so here in South Florida, um, from June to September, we will get rain every day. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely every day. Four o'clock, boom, rain. It might only last for five minutes, but it'll it'll get everything wet. So, uh, yeah. And, and this is Lynn. I have more of an observation than a comment. You uh, recommend net pots, which I've been using for my lalias, but as Tom said earlier, they grow like weeds here. And as a result, the roots are so prolific that I was just repotting and dividing them and the roots have gone in out one out in the net pot and back in another so they become so interwoven I can't get them out of the net pot so I just made a note to self no more net pots no more net pots for ancestors yeah. oh, okay uh, they're just well, so vigorous the roots um, are just over the top right right um uh I I I recommend the root the the net pots because in South Florida, we need to really uh, emphasize or overemphasize the the drainage and aeration in the root zone. So um, because you I know get so much rain. because we do get so much rain now yeah. in Southern California, um, uh, like Sunset Valley orchids and um, in the Santa Barbara orchid estate, they grow. They grow their anceps in pots and they don't, I mean, not net pots, just plain plastic pots. And, and, and uh, uh, when I first moved to South Florida, that's how I did it, but it just was too wet. For, for well, they also spirit. grow in rocks, so they don't hold the yeah. water. Yeah. 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 So I've been using, I've been using um, straight charcoal as a media in baskets as well. Interesting. Um, um, you know, uh, gone to the local Costco and picked up a bag of the chunk, uh, you know, charcoal, not briquettes, the chunk charcoal that a lot of folks are, are using in their barbecues. And uh, that works out really well because they're really big chunks. And uh, you can put a uh, it doesn't take a lot of uh, pieces and, and you'll get enough in there that your, your plant has something to grab onto. But that's been very successful because it doesn't help the water drain super well. Try a handball racket. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it yeah. works very well. I have oh, one on the handball racket and one on a the sole of an old yep. shoe which I yep. used to demonstrate with, but people throw away old handball rackets and they make great mounts. <laughs> excellent. That's excellent. All right. So um, uh, I, I'm sorry I wasn't able to provide you guys with a raffle table. It's just not really, uh, you guys are so far away this time. Um, didn't work out, but you know maybe sometime in the future uh, I could take a trip out to to the bay and uh, we could do a talk uh, when you guys go back live. That'll be wonderful in the future someday. <laughs> That'd be great, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I got my family's in Southern California, so you know this would be it's just another excuse to go visit family. Yeah, you know, it's not, you know, it's part live. I don't know how many are in the room. There's like, uh, you know, 30 some odd in line and probably about the same number in the room. So it's a hybrid. Yeah, we're a little over 20 here. Yeah, today. yeah, hybrid. You guys got a hybrid going on. Um, yeah, this is great. And I'm, you know, I'm fortunate. I feel really fortunate to have that opportunity to speak to your group. So thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful for me. Thank and you. Go ahead. Okay. 
Uh, well, thank you, Jim. That was great. Uh, lovely talk. All right. Thank you very much. Um, since it's about past my bedtime, I'll uh, I'll I'll see you guys later. And thank you again for the invitation. I really really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you, you. And have a great night. All right. All right. Bye. Great. So now we'll transition to the show and tell here in the room. Um, someone want to give me a hand with bringing up the things to the camera? Adam, can you share screen? Can you share screen with me? Sure. Do you want to go? Uh, oh no, I'm sorry. Go in the room first. Beg your pardon. Okay. Is is our camera a little blurry still? I was trying to work on that. Yeah. Hazy. Hazy. Okay. Let me try something else. A little clearer? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And can okay. you take down your mask to, then we can hear you better? Or do you need your mask? To, yeah, thank you. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Sure, it's better. Okay. Um, I'll just start grabbing plants if anyone wants to help here. Okay. They're connected. We'll put them right here. Where's the camera? Oh, you're going there. Are you yeah. still on there? Uh, yeah, it's all blurry. Okay, so these are from Andrea. Uh, they are Love Sound. Okay. Get them nice and close. She's born with Jim. Mick, Mick Howell times uh, BLC Love Sound. Nice yellow. Yeah, very beautiful yellow. Say again? Oh. Great presentation. <laughs> okay, this is from Tom. Is it Merritt's? Oh, thank you. Uh, so, do you want to help me with this? Perfect. Arangus hildebrandia. Very delicate, tiny little orangish flowers. Teeny tiny. Teeny tiny. Lots of flowers. Yes, yeah, so many. Very well done. Thank you. More from Tom. He's brought a lot tonight. Uh, Asphodosian Argentina. Coming right here. Might show up better against my black shirt. Does that look a little better? Perfect. Yeah. Just don't wiggle it. It's very wiggly because it's so small and delicate. About that back in the desert room, and it's like the name is bigger than the plant. Yes. Okay, Tom just said he's got about 20 of these at home if anyone wants to start trying to grow one of those. All right, Ron, we've got uh, this is. Uh, Those things grow indoors. Uh, Disa Viciana. Disa Viciana, also from yeah, Tom. Um, he got that off the raffle table last year. Here's a, another one from Tom. It's a path far bottom. Far bottom. Oh, wow. Really delicate little, there's some really delicate little hairs along the edge. Very pretty. Thank you. Uh, this is Path Shupaculii from Tom as well. Very nice green.
Here's, I think, the last from Tom. It's another path. Concolor. Oh, wow. Polka dots. Yeah, they're really, really intricate little dots here. Um, this is Catlia Valentina, which is a Catlia bifolate Catlia, which you don't see very often. It's pretty rare to see this around. This is from DJ. Behind us. Thank you, DJ. The last one from here in the room. There, yeah. This is a Phalaenopsis bellina, a pink variety, which is again something you don't see very often. Usually these are a darker color. This is a nice pale pink. Great. Um, yeah, so that's what we've got in the room. And so, Lynn, I will pass it over to you. You can Thank you. share your Thank screen. You. So what do you see? <laughs> so we see your, um, your screen, but it also has all of your notes to the left of it. OK, let me get my exercise. Um, Want to go to slideshow. Tom and Sasha? Tom? It, uh, just uh, on the. Uh... OK, here I go. Here comes Sasha to say hello. <gasps> Hi, Sasha. Here they are. You see it? Not yet. It's uh, it still shows all of your notes and stuff too. Uh, from the beginning there, and it'll start. Hey, Hi there. Hi, Tom. Yeah. All right. Let's do the. Okay. Let's see where we are here. Here's yeah, I think you just Stop click on from the beginning and I think I'm sure. Okay. And let's do I'm gonna There, there you go. go, that's it, perfect. That's it. Perfect. Just take yourself off mute. <gasps> take yourself off mute so we can, so Sasha can say hi to us. Yeah, un un unmute, Tom, un un unmute the, uh... you're muted. No, we're not. No, you're not. Oh, hi, Sasha. Hi, Tom. Sasha says hello. Hello, hi, everybody. Sasha. All right. So Baby, this is SF. So yeah, Sasha and I are going to do show and tell tonight, and Lynn's going to be. <laughs> All right. And tonight, rather than doing orchids, we're going to do train pictures. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm leaving. Yay. All right. Okay. All right. Tell us okay. which channel. We'll be there. <laughs> okay, everybody. <laughs> Move you away. So fun. Um, here we go. So there's still lots of bloom. We have lots of beautiful virtual show and tell table. We have 40 lovely orchids, 14 contributors. So thank you for taking the time to photograph and send me your photos. Let's get started. The order in which I show them is always the order in which I receive them. So no preference here. 
Judy Carney starts us off with Trichopilia hennessiana. This is one of my favorite South American species. It's found mostly in Colombia and Ecuador. It's a cool to cold growing epiphyte at elevations up to 8,200 feet. So that tells us the uh, it likes cool. As you can see, the inflorescences arise from the base of the pseudobulb, so it's best to pot this fairly high in the center of your pot so the flowers can hang over the edge for a beautiful display like Judy's. It likes year-round water, less in the winter, and it likes filtered or diffuse light. The three-inch flowers are really pleasantly fragrant. This is Judy's Epidendrum Parkinsonianum. This is a species found from southern Mexico through Central America to Panama, where it's widespread, but it's uncommonly found it's an epiphyte uh, in pine oak forest at 5,000 to 7,500 feet. So it also likes cool temperatures and much less water in the winter. It should receive um, as much light as possible short of burning the foliage. The leaves may have a purple tinge when light levels are near the maximum that the plant can tolerate. This grows pendently as you can see. So it's best grown mounted or in a basket so that it can come through the bottom slats. The striking starry flowers are more than six inches and they have a citrusy fragrant. Uh, Epidendrum is part of the Catlea Alliance, so it's often used in breeding orchids. This is Judea's Encyclia or Prosecchia citrina. She has some wonderful color forms of it. This is actually Euchylia citrina. Euchylia is a newly formed genus with three species which were recently removed from Encyclia because of their glaucous appearance with gray or uh, gray-green foliage and pseudobulbs. Uh, the species is endemic to central and southern Mexico, where it's a small size pendant, cool to cold growing orchid. This is a good outdoor grower in the Bay Area, as it does best if it's given winter night temperatures into the low 40s. But as we were talking about earlier with the Lelias, it must be protected from winter rains as it needs a fairly hard dry rest. The flowers are about three inches long. They have a citrusy fragrance, hence the species name Citrina. In Mexico, the Citrina flower is said to relieve stomach disorders and the pseudobulbs are used to make poultices. But please don't try this without the advice of your physician. This is Tom Pickford's Catlea grandis, formerly Lelia grandis. This is a Brazilian species found. What's that? This is a Brazilian species found mostly in the. Okay, love you. Love you too. Oh, sorry. Need to go on mute. <laughs> this is a Brazilian species found mostly in the southern Bahia region, somewhat inland as a hot to cool growing epiphyte. Tom grows it in his cool greenhouse, which gets down into the. 40s on winter nights and it's it's thriving in his conditions. In Brazil it grows on tall trees in nearly full sun and you can see by the light green leaf color in this photo that Tom is growing it very bright. The flowers are four to five inches and sometimes fragrant. This is Tom's Lycasti Depii, named not for Johnny Depp but for a 19th century British collector named Depp was first discovered in Mexico but its range extends down through Northern and South America, where they're most often found growing as epiphytes in wet mountain forests at 3,600 to about 5,600 feet. So intermediate to cool conditions and dappled light with good humidity. The leaves are mostly deciduous, as you can see on Thomas plant. And you can also see that the single flowered inflorescences arise from the base of the older pseudobulbs before the new growths begin to appear. We see some new ones beginning there. When the leaves fall off, they should be kept cooler and drier until the new growths arise. Tom's flowers are very flat, very well displayed. They're about four and a half to five inches with very interesting rust colored spots and blotches on the sepals. This is Tom's Prostechia marii, also known as Encyclia marii, another Mexican species. This one is found in dry oak forests in semi shade in the mountains of northeastern Mexico up to nearly to the Texas border at elevations of 3,300 to about 4,000 feet. These flowers are huge and dramatic, hanging down from the mounted plant. The flowers are about four inches and they're dominated by the very large ruffled white lip. This grows in Tom's cool greenhouse, night temps into the mid 40s, so probably a good um, outdoor Bay Area growing candidate. This is Tom's Clesocentrin gokusingii, I like to say that. 
with striking clusters of blue-gray flowers and a dark violet stripe inside the lip. Tom Splint was awarded an AMAOS last year when he took it for judging and had 74 flowers. There are a number of um, new monopodial growth starting to develop along the plant. You can see them in the left-hand photo. So he looks forward to an even more striking uh, display next year. This is a species native to Borneo, growing at about 6,000 feet in cool, mossy forests in medium light. This could also be a good windowsill candidate. Jan right. Anderson shows us Dendrobium victoria regine. Wow is right. Uh, this commonly is commonly known in its native Philippines as Queen Victoria's Dendrobium. It was discovered in 1910. This is a really striking dark form of the flower. It's about an inch across and the flowers arise from older leafless canes, canes. And I've read that too bright light can result in premature leaf drop. It's a cool to cold growing epiphyte generally found with its roots, roots in moss in deep shade with plenty of air movement. It's often found with rhododendrons and azaleas, which I thought was interesting. The stems are pendulous, so it's best grown in a basket or mounted on a quartz slab with a moisture retaining pad. It can bloom intermittently during the year, often twice a year. This is just a gorgeous flower, Jan. This is Fred Anderson's Phragmopedium Jerry Lee Fisher. This is a hybrid made by Jason Fisher and registered in 2014. So presumably Jerry Lee Fisher is his father or his son or a favorite uncle. Uh, this flower is over five inches wide and it gets its fabulous size from the Covacii parent and the brilliant crimson color from the Fragbesii parent. This is a large plant which should not be allowed to dry out between waterings. It prefers medium light and intermediate temperatures. Fred grows this in their greenhouse, but it could be a good indoor candidate although it's a large plant, maybe in a humid bathroom. This is Fred's Phragmopedium sedenii. This is a primary hybrid of two Colombian species and what a striking offspring of these two parents. The clone candidum is awarded by the AOS in 1992 in Oceanside, California. And since Fred and Jan recently moved to the Bay Area from Southern California, I'm guessing they brought it north with them. The awarded flower was 14 centimeters or over five inches wide. And the interior of that lip is just striking. Jan's Cattleya pulcherima, once known as Lelia pulcherima. <clears throat> this is a primary hybrid of two Brazilian species, Lelia purpurata and Lelia lobata, which is also called Lelia boothiata. The bold stripes inside the uh, trumpet lip are very characteristic of the Lelia purpurata parent. And the color of this flower is just gorgeous. If you look at the flower, the photo on the left, it looks like Jan and Fred have pretty much filled up their new greenhouse, doesn't it? <laughs> Dale Martin shows this Bulbophyllum frostii, which I think is the most adorable of all the bulbos. It looks like tiny Dutch clogs or shoes. The flowers are about an inch and they're entirely covered in little short hairs, little stubby hairs, probably to deter predators of some sort. This is thought to be endemic to Vietnam, where it was discovered nearly a century ago. Many bulbos are fragrant, often unpleasantly so. I don't know if Frostia is fragrant, but that carrion colored interior is likely designed to attract flies to pollinate it. This is Dale Selogeny pandurata. This is a warm to hot growing species from Borneo and the Philippines. And the small in situ photo on the left uh, by Patricia Harding was taken in Borneo. So this gives you a sense of its size and natural growth habit. It's a large sized epiphyte, not probably for the typical windowsill. It's typically found near rivers or streams with really good humidity. It's most easily grown in a wire basket because it spreads out pretty rapidly. And it's best to repot it just as the new lead emerges. The Baker notes on this indicate that it requires no dry rest. It will grow well in low light, but usually will not flower unless the conditions are very bright. The flowers are more than three inches. They're fragrant of honey. And Dale's pristine plant, look, plant looks tons better than the one growing, growing in nature, which is, is typical. This is Dale's Cytonfiniana, Cytonfadiana, excuse me, Metrata. I think this hits the applause meter. 
Cytan fatiana is a monotypic genus, which means there's only one species in the genus, and this is it, Cytan fadinia nitrata. This is a species from Thailand and Burma, which was first described in 1864 by Riekenbach as Erides metrata. It was subsequently removed from Erides by Gunnar Seidenfaden, a Danish taxonomist in 1972, who when he described it, he named it after himself. Had Mr. Riekenbach still been alive 100 years after he discovered this, he might've had something to say about that. This is a hot to worm growing epiphyte. It's a monopodial. Uh, with unbranched, unbranched inflorescences. You can see that Dale is growing this just exceptionally well. Look at that pristine foliage. Dale calls this photo a paphiopetalum party. <laughs> Aren't they having a grand old time? Dale is a top-notch grower of many, many orchids, but paths are really a specialty of his, and we can, we can see why. Dave Hermeyer shows us Maxillaria tenuifolia. Tenuifolia means with slender, delicate leaves. And Dave's leaves are super with no brown tips. But what we all love this plant for is the coconut scented or uh, copper tone suntan lotion scent. The flowers are about two inches across and they're quite long lasting. This is a species from Mexico to Costa Rica. It's found in rainforests and tropical semi-deciduous forests from sea level to about 3,300 feet. So it prefers intermediate temperatures uh, with night lows only into the high 50s. Filtered or diffused light. So this is a really good windowsill grower. It's often available from local vendors. So be sure to look for it at Orchids in the Park this July 30th to 31st. And Dave's band is Cerulescence. Cerulea means blue or bluish. It's known in Thailand as the sky blue vanda. Hmm, but to my eye, if you love purple, this one's for you. And this is also a potential home grower. It likes intermediate temperatures, bright indirect light and strong air movement, much less water during the winter months. These striking flowers are about an inch and a half. That's a species from Southeast Asia at elevations from 1500 to almost 5,000 feet. It grows well mounted as Dave has it here or in a wooden slat basket with little or no media. The flowers are long lasting and they have a pleasing scent of grapes. Valerie Mountain shows us Dendrobium unicum. She says it has over 40 flowers on three canes, including one splinted with Q-tips and tape, which you can see in the left-hand photo. <laughs> that one partially broke last year, but it apparently still has life left in it. The flowers st started opening for her in early May, and it's still going strong. She keeps it in intermediate conditions in her house and an east-facing window. It gets a dry rest from November to February with just a weekly misting and a weekly watering the rest of the year. She says the leaves will start to drop off soon along with the flowers and next year's first growth is already starting in the top of the left-hand photo. The leafless canes bloom as well as the new ones with leaves. Belle got this from Andy's orchids at POE in 2018 and the tag says, quote, deciduous. I may look dead, but I'm probably not. This is a charming little species from Vietnam and Thailand, and the fragrance is like tangerines. Mm. Roberta Fox shows us Telepogon astroglossus. Telepogon is an epiphytic cloud forest genus of about 200 species found from Costa Rica to Peru, mostly in the high Andes. They proved to be one of the most difficult orchids to maintain for any length of time. They're delicate dwarf epiphytes without pseudobulbs. So because they don't have pseudobulbs, they don't store water. So they need damp cloud forest conditions with deep shade, cool temperatures, and ample air circulation. They're one of the wettest orchids that you can grow. And as such, they need to be misted constantly and watered regularly with good quality water. Astroglossus, meaning star-shaped lip, um, is from Peru at elevations around 2,800 feet. This is the telepogon for those of us who are too warm for most members of this genus. It's also great for those who are out of space as this is a micro mini. You can see Roberta's thumb in the lower left photo. This charming little flower is about a quarter of an inch. Roberta grows this outdoors on her Southern California patio. Roberta's Eulophia speciosa. Eulophia is a, an interesting genus in that it's 
212 terrestrial species are found on three different continents, the tropical Americas, Asia and, Af Asia and Africa. Eulophia speciosa is a native to much of the east and southern Africa from a range of elevations where it grows in sandy soil. Roberta grows it in pure sand. She says that in past years, she moved it away from the sprinklers, letting it just get water from the occasional winter rain. Last winter, she didn't move it, so it got watered along with the rest of the orchids, and it responded by putting out a burst of new growth. So clearly it can tolerate drying out, but it doesn't need it. She also gives it some time release fertilizer. The flowers are about an inch, and looking at them, they, they make me think of a wrinkled but still beautiful old woman. This is Roberta's epidendrum lacustre. The common name is, name is the lakeside epidendrum. The species is native to a wide area of Central America and Northern South America from a range of elevations. This is the purple form found in Panama. As you can see, the backs of the leaves are dark purple and there is a purple blush on the flowers. Roberta has found that even a small reduction in light causes this color of the flowers to be rather washed out. The typical form has white and green flowers, as you see lower left, lower right, excuse me. She grows this in full sun, hanging with her Lely anseps, and it needs to be pretty much sopping wet. To achieve that, she puts a big lump of sphagnum in the middle of the pot, just filled in around the side with small bark. The large photo shows two divisions of the plant, each in two gallon of pot, right next to each other. She said that she had to split it to uh, get the plants so that she could lift them and hang them. This is really spectacular, Roberta. This is Roberta's Disa sagittalis. Roberta has the most interesting collection of unusual species. This Disa species is native to the Cape area of South Africa, where it's found in stony soil and rock crevasses. While it grows near streams, it does not need to stay as wet as other members of the genus. It has a much shorter dormancy than other Mediterranean climate terrestrials, and Roberta says it's a lot easier to grow than the big showy desas. Uh, the flowers are about three quarters of an inch. I think they're really very charming. Susan Anderson shows us Oncidium phymatochylum, which is also known as Miltonia phymatochyla. Which I thought was strange. This, is, this looks like a cloud of several hundred two inch flowers on tall branching inflorescences and it blooms on just the upper portions of the inflorescences. You can see that the leaves are quite stiff and leathery. Jay Fowl says that this species is found in Brazil, Mexico and Guatemala, which would indicate that there are large geographic gaps in the range. Brazil, Mexico, and Guatemala are pretty far apart. And that kind of raises the question as to whether this really is a single species. Susan grows it in her intermediate greenhouse. The most recent award on this species was in 2021, a uh, certificate of cultural excellence to Ken and Amy Jacobson with 2,300 flowers. And I think in a couple of years, this, Susan's plant will, will exceed that. This is Susan Shonorchis manipurensis. It's a miniature species from India, Burma, and Thailand, where it's found as a worm growing epiphyte at elevations up to about 3,200 feet, often growing on the roots of Renathra imschutiana. Thought that was interesting. The baker notes indicate it prefers dapple shade or filtered light, but that light may be gradually increased until the plant starts to show signs of stress. Strong air movement should be provided at all times. These bright magenta flowers are about a quarter of an inch. Susan grows this in her intermediate greenhouse with winter nighttime temperatures down to the high 50s, less water during the winter. This is Susan's Bulbophyllum lobii, and the clone Kathy's Gold is highly awarded. It is one of several color forms of lobii, which can range from this golden yellow with little maroon dots and stripes to a dark mahogany colored flower. This species is widespread throughout Southeast Asia at a wide range of elevations from 2,500 to about 7,000 feet. So they can adapt to a pretty wide range of temperatures growing for you, making, makes, makes this a great windowsill plant. The lip is hinged, so it moves in the breeze to attract the pollinator, and it is quite fragrant. Many consider this lobii flower to be the finest of the Bulbophyllum genus. This is Susan's Pleurothallus linearis, 
which I could find almost no information on. Perhaps his Pleurothallis linearia folia? Don't know. If any of the Pleurothallid Alliance folks have any information on this, please chime in on chat. It's certainly thriving here in Susan's collection. Andrea Lodate shows us Potanara norma sue, which if you look at the bottom left picture, uh, the plant tag shows that she purchased it as an unregistered hybrid, but it was registered by Fred Clark in 2017 as Potanara norma sue. It's a very complex hybrid with at least 10 cattleyas in its parentage, resulting in this golden flower with distinct uh, red orange keels inside the ruffled lip. We all know Andrea loves purple, so I'm very curious to know how she got the fence behind one photo to be purple. Jeffrey Doney shows us this beautifully grown and sickly of prismatocarpa. It has six spikes and they're in full bloom. He says he's had it about 10 years. This is a delightful mid-sized species from Costa Rica and Panama, where it's found at elevations from about 4,000 to 4,500 feet. So it can be grown cool to warm. And it's a great windowsill candidate with long lasting waxy leopard spotted flowers. It likes moderately bright dappled light and good air movement. Um, I lost mine to mealybugs a year or so ago. And we'll be looking for one at our Orcas in the Park sale, July 30th to 31st. Mark those dates down. Deborah Vales Coulter shows us Pleurothallis stricta, first described by Luer in 1979. So it's a relatively newly discovered species found in Colombia and Ecuador in cloud forests at elevations up to 8,200 feet. So it's cool to a cold grower, uh, can probably do well outdoors, protected in the Bay Area, uh, like shade or heavily diffuse light, and it likes strong air movement. The charming, these charlie little flowers look to me like restrepias. They can be two to five inches long. Very nice job, Deborah. This is Deborah's Oncidium spacellatum. It's a vigorous grower and a, also a good windowsill candidate. It's a species found in Mexico and Central America. I grow it in my intermediate greenhouse with winter nights down to about 58 degrees and in bright indirect light. I've sold a number of divisions at POE and at Orchids in the Park, and I think Tanya may have as well. This is a rewarding medium-sized plant with lots of long-lasting flowers, good for your windowsill. This is Deborah's Cymbidium Dorothy Stocksill Forbidden Fruit. This is a very complex hybrid registered by a Californian grower Everett Stocksill in 1992. And it's been a favorite at shows and on the judging tables ever since. The sepals and petals often have the slightest white margins we see on, we see on Deborah's which also set off the deep burgundy lip. Cymbidiums are much loved as outdoor growers in the Bay Area. You just can't have too many cymbidiums. The tag on this plant, Deborah's plant is Dendrobium flickeri. I was not able to find any information on this orchid, but it probably is an Australian hybrid of Kingianum with some Tetragonum and a few others in there. The color is striking. The lip is very complex. If Let anyone knows, it. yeah. Let it. Lecari, F-L-E-C-K-E-R-I. Lecari. F-L-E-C-K. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah, you got it? Got it. Tendrobium flecari. The color is really striking. The lip is, lip is pretty complex. So thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. Tom heard I was a little short on show and tell photos tonight, so he slipped <laughs> in a couple more. This is his Trichocentrum pumalum. It's very stiff, leathery leaves. Dramatic bursts of canary yellow flowers, each one only about a third of an inch, but creeping, creating just a beautiful display here. This plant is a miniature. It's only about six inches tall, so your windowsill has room for this little charmer. Tom grows it cool. It could probably be happy outdoors in the, around the bay, but protected. This is Tom's Catlea Zip. This was one of Fred Schull's favorites, and Tom was able to purchase a piece of this from uh, Fred's collection. It has grown and thrived for Tom. This is a primary hybrid of Tenebrosa by Milleri. These are both Brazilian beauties. The diminutive size of, size of Milleri brings down the size of the Tenebrosa, resulting in this medium-sized Cattleya hybrid, which is very floriferous. And don't those flowers just pop? This is my Lelia Brigari. This is a miniature rupiculus Lelia from Brazil, 
where it grows directly on sandstone rocks in small cracks and crevasses at about 4,500 feet of elevation. So I grow it in my cool greenhouse with the winter temperatures into the low 40s. This is a great outdoors candidate for the Bay Area and Gold Country Orcas often offers them for sale. This is a little uh, Lelia that Alan also uses often for hybridizing. This plant is about seven inches tall. The flowers are about two and a half inches. They're very long lasting. I grow it in a mixture of tree fern and volcanic rock, so I don't need to disturb it very often. This is my Bulbophyllum pectinatum, an albiform called Transcerus anaensis. You can see the typical color form at the right. I bought this from Andy's Orcas a couple years ago, mounted on a stick, and this is its first blooming. The flowers only last about 10 days, but I thought they were pretty charming. This is a Southeast Asian epiphyte, uh, found up to 8,200 feet. So it's in my cool greenhouse where it gets watered twice weekly, a little more often when the temperatures warm up in Bellinas. Bulbos are great windowsill candidates. They come in all sizes and shapes and colors. Some nicely fragrant, some not so nice. And just to give Orcas in the Park one more plug in case you didn't know, this is a great little summer show put, in by, put on by San Francisco Orchid Society with vendors from around the globe and some lovely displays. This is your next great chance to buy, to add a few beauties to your collections. And if you volunteer for one or more shifts, no experience needed, uh, you'll get free admission to the event and also a free lunch. It's fun, it's easy, and we'd really appreciate your help. Contact Dave Hermeyer or Google San Francisco Orchid Society, click on events and use the volunteer sign up form at the bottom of the page. And lastly, our pet parade, not exactly a pet, but Diane Bond has this beautiful fox and her four little kits living under her deck. Thanks for sharing these. That's it for tonight. Thank you to everyone who contributed photos. See you next month and see what orcas in the park. Great Thank job, you. Lynn. Thank yeah. you. Great. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, we can wrap up here in the room as well. Um, yeah, just around everybody who's online who wants to enter the raffle for the Sunset Valley Orchids gift certificate, please just enter your name in the chat. Just say something. Yeah, there you go. Um, next meeting, we're going to have uh, Bob Hamilton live and in person. Um, wow. So if you want to come on down, come on down. But you don't have to, of course. Um, and we'll get started with the raffle in a second. And yeah, just to echo Lynn, uh, go ahead and sign up to volunteer at Orchids in the Park and we'll see you again then in about a month and a half. All right, thanks everyone. All right. Good night. I thought you're gonna do the raffle and other stuff before you close the meeting. <clears throat> Sasha, <laughs> baby Sasha. <laughs> Cute. She is so much bigger now. Hi, Susan. Hello. Where do I go to sign up for the drawing? I can't find it. Very bottom in the, go into the chat. I'm in the chat. Just put your name in the chat and you'll be entered into the drawing. And then I'll, I have to randomize and pull up names out of a hat and you'll get a note from me tomorrow.